right. Uh, this is Toby from Heavyweight MMA here today with the man, Mr. Carnage, Nathan Carnage Corbett from Australia, um, known for his lethal elbows, um, which is pretty kind of surprising, actually, because mostly in the heavyweight sort of divisions, most people in, the, in history don't really fight as much with elbows, right? No, no. Uh, traditionally, they, they kind of don't. Um, heavyweight Muay Thai is kind of on a little bit of a slight comeback. I just saw recently the, the WBC Muay Thai um, just put on a couple of heavyweight Muay Thai fights uh, for world title belts, which was kind of surprising because since I actually stopped competing, uh, well, actually my last, last Muay Thai world title fight was December 2013. 2014 was my last time I fought. But since that time, I haven't really seen anyone um, other than Glory really sort of reigning on that heavyweight sort of Muay Thai um, <clears throat> stage. So typically it doesn't happen as much. I'm not sure if it's because the big boys tend to, you know, stay with the K1 rules or they don't want to throw elbows at that weight. But, um, yeah, I mean, obviously Muay Thai is more popular in the light divisions, claiming that obviously because the ties are smaller. So it could be a bit of both. Yeah, man. Like I'm, as I'm looking through a list of some of your opponents and that, there's a few guys that are that are Thai based um, from Australia as well. Slawinski, Bannon, Danny Maskachev, um, Kiwis, Jason Vermeil, Aaron Boys, McKinnon. These guys they're they're known for for as Muay Thai stylists, a couple of them, but none of them are known as um, elbow experts, right? You you're the only one I can think of, actually, to be honest, out of out of all the heavier sort of guys in Australia that was kind of actually almost out of everyone really that was uh, so focused on elbows, right? That really did so much damage with the elbows. Yeah, like without how would I say without you know rubber moan, tooth moan, horn or whatever, but the, the facts are facts, right? And the honest truth is, there's no one in the world. Um, it doesn't matter where you look. There's no one in the world that threw elbows like me um, at that what, that high weight division from cruiserweight up to heavyweight. There's no one that even really throws them. Of course, there are people that have you know fought at that weight and thrown elbows. Of course, I'm not saying they haven't, but to have such a dominating and such a evident career from 2003 when I stepped into my first world title fight, got the you know the elbow KO, and then that was when they said, okay, the man with the golden elbows, you know, I'd already been winning and beating people like Scott Bannon and, you know, Danny Maskiff and Aaron Boys and, you know, all these kind of like, you know, fighters, you know, Jason Vermeer, all this sort of local talent between, you know, Australia and New Zealand um, fighters and then went on to winning that first world title against Clifton Brown with a big overhand pound like elbow just hit him there out cold in the first round. I even surprised myself, just like, what? <laughs> well, a champion, like, you know, I finally got there, you know, you just didn't expect it. <clears throat> and then they come out the next, you know, the month, the next month, which was um, January 2004, where they had a, a magazine called The International Kickboxer. Very no familiar with that one, up. man. I was a, yeah. I was an avid collector of that back in the day. Yeah, yeah. So they don't publish that anymore. That was Mark Hammer, Cassinetti, and obviously things have changed now with hard magazines and social media, but it was a good time to run. Just loved that. It was a Bible, you know, it was the fight Bible. And it was kind of cool. So then I come out, the man with the golden elbows, you know, obviously I'd been doing damage and then won that fight. So that's sort of when it just sort of like took off and I went off, you know, I just went on a 10 year tear, tear really. Cause from 2003 to 2013, December, like I mentioned was my last world title fight. And I was sort of undefeated in, um, in those 10 years as a, as a world in, in world title fights, I was undefeated in Muay Thai. So we got a couple quite a, quite a, quite a lot of elbow finishes in that in that period as well yeah man i remember that i remember you featuring in that magazine man uh, like you said it was pretty cool cool magazine i even had my name in the back a couple of times in the in the sort of amateur section so pretty stoked to be a part of that as well yeah. <laughs> man i'm from new south wales so like i always used to look at you guys up in the up in the north part of queensland etc uh fighting elbows and knees and be jealous because they just didn't have it down, down where I was at the time, you know, back in the, in the nineties. And um, yeah, it would have, would have been great. Like at the end of my just amateur fighting, I never fought pro in my amateurs. I, I did a, a padded tie boxing and I'm just in there. Oh, I can use my elbows and boom through it. And, and yeah. it's interesting. I heard you, I heard you mentioning about um, elbows that you need to be, um, you need to be actually 
are fighting with elbows to really get better because you can't really practice in sparring. Um, you can't spar elbows, right? Because you'll you'll mess each other up. So so That's you've been right. you practice in your fights, and you threw probably uh, many many more than anyone else, right? Well, that's it. And going back to the <clears throat> the rules around, um, you know, New South Wales and not having the elbows, uh, it was it was banned. You know, the athletic commission, whatever commission they want to call themselves, <clears throat> mind you, I hate commissions because commissions they think they're helping us, but they're really you know keeping our sport down. And um, <clears throat> they blocked you know elbow the, the use of elbows. So of course, they've run in New South Wales. They weren't you know been able to get those elbow fights. Queensland. Um, and, and Western Australia were the two dominant states of, um, you know, elbow fighting as such. Back then, at least, you know, now it's all over the place. You know, everyone's doing extremely well. Melbourne, Sydney, everyone's doing good now because it's opened up. But back in the day, it was tall then. Really, Queensland was the number one state, of course. But then you know, it was always that, you know, <clears throat> East versus West and Perth, you know, was very dominant. Muay Thai as well with Darren Kuravik, Darren Reese, and a lot of good champions over there from the pioneer age of Muay Thai. And, um, yeah, so it's exactly right. I mean, that's the thing about elbows. Like, you can you can spar with them, but not really, you know what I mean? So yep. that's why, like, touch sparring is good for skill, but obviously sparring hard obviously brings that reality to it. So you can't do that with elbows. So you really need to have those fights where you can actually get into the fight and throw real, 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 real elbows and real battle. Yeah, man. Which is one of the – yeah, <clears throat> sorry, you go. I was just going to say, um, I'm feeling pretty dangerous right now, man. Uh, elbows are being unleashed after purchasing the Carnage Striking Series ah. Mastering Elbows, mate. Um, I did purchase it. I think anyone that's listening that's interested in, in getting better at elbows should learn from the best, which is Nathan Corbett. Uh, have a look at the, at the series. Really not expensive for what it is, man. You could do a private lesson in, in most countries probably for the same cost as, as getting the whole series from you can learn a lot right. and um and then then the after you learn from carnage you just practice just pull them out wherever you want they're kind of you can use them in every occasion really like elbows right any anyone pops up that's a dickhead anywhere whether it's in your in your <laughs> nightclub in your fight in your in your family occasion your family picnic just pull out the elbows and throw them mate no but very very good series man i'm impressed with the with the work you've done there well that's it you know i mean it took you know as many years actually uh kind of a story around it was that, you know, I finished fighting and I didn't know what I was going to do. So I thought oh, I'll just put out on Instagram at the time world tour. And I hadn't even had a, I didn't even have a, a date booked anywhere. I was just like fishing. <clears throat> and then that started my momentum of doing seminars. Then I end up in these, doing all these seminars around the world. I'm like, well, what am I going to teach? You know, cause my, my uh, upbringing of martial arts, other than my karate upbringing, where you had like, you know, white belt to black belt, you had a syllabus and you had to learn all the different, you know, techniques like you do these days, say in jujitsu, you kind of have a syllabus book to follow. Like, okay, section one, you know, da, 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 section two, da, da, da. So you have something to draw back from or draw on to be able to teach. So then I get into my fight career and I'm just fighting. Like, <clears throat> Someone taught me a jab, someone taught me to cross, someone showed me how to do an elbow once, so on, you know, and so forth. But really, without like <clears throat> taking away from any of my coaches that helped assist me and, and, and tune me along the way, it was really that deep desire, <clears throat> excuse me, it was really that deep desire to just like win. And then when I saw the elbow when I was young, I was like, this is the weapon. Like, why would you not throw an elbow? It's, it's so brutal, it's so savage, it can do a lot of damage, it's, it's close to the face, you know, I don't have to get my foot and bring it off the floor. So then I started to teach all these seminars and go, okay, what am I even going to teach? Because for me, it's not really a combination. Nothing's a combination. It's just you learn you learn moves and you put them together and the ball rings and you go and attack the person. Of course, there's certain pathways and there's certain movement patterns and there's certain, you know, stylistically things in Thai boxing that you'll see all the time that you can kind of almost, you know, anticipate happening because it probably will happen. But overall, I never really had a system. So then over many, 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 many years of seminars and stuff like that, I went, okay, I'm going to start writing stuff down. So I'm going to write stuff down. And that's where I designed this, the Elbow Striking series, because then it has it's 20 videos. And look, I could do another 20, um, and I will do in the future another uh, spin-off on it, because it's always evolving. It's always advancing. It's always changing. Um, but what I wanted to get out of the video series was my mind in the fight that everyone saw was how I try to bring that onto paper and go, here's a step, one, two, three, four, five, six, and here's 20 different videos and 20 different varieties, 20 different options 
for you to do it. <clears throat> However, the only way you're going to do any of that is you make a decision before the bell rings that you pretty much want to elbow people, but not without forgetting that you have kicks, punches, knees, blocks, this, that, or all the other stuff you've already got. So that's how I designed the series is to kind of plug you into what I did without thought. I just moved into the fire and I just saw it and went for it. Yeah. So I was trying to have to break it down into a, an educational structure that even when I say at the end, I okay, go, here you go. Here's the, here's, here's the step. Now add it to your own style, add the energy to your style. And then when you're out there fighting, now the chances of it happening are a lot bigger. Ne necessarily won't happen, but the chances are way bigger than they were before you, you know, um, before you've seen the series. Stuff. Yeah, man. It's uh, it's interesting. <laughs> like uh, it's, it's all part of, you mentioned in, in some of your interviews about the journey, your journey as a martial artist, that you had a journey, you walked the path of a fighter, and now your next step sounded like your your interest and and focus is on teaching. And I think uh, the the um the the martial arts are improved by guys like you um, and some of the other good guys that that have developed systems from the their after their fighting. Pretty much, you look at Liam Harrison's got some amazing stuff now online. Uh, Dwayne Bang Ludwig, these guys have gone that next step and actually formulated a system based on their experience fighting. And now it's the same thing with you. You've done this, uh, the same thing in an area that these guys touch on briefly, but not as in as much detail as you, because this is your specialist area. Um, so yeah, it's good. You're actually evolving the game just by breaking it down into a system rather than just having to learn intuitively, like, like you mentioned. Yeah, no, they're, they're two big players. You know, Liam's massive. He's, you know, he's crushing it. He's, he's still currently looking, at him, looking to fight again. So he's really super active. He's been doing this for a long time. Yeah. I didn't really um, sort of jump on like, oh, you know, let's go online, you know, COVID, blah, blah, blah. blah. I didn't really do that. I, I was traveling through Europe. I was supposed to fly back to Australia last year in April and, um, and film it in Australia. I was going to do it back there. And a friend said, I'll, I'll, I'll put the money up. I'll invest and let's get it going. I said, okay, cool. Let's do it. And then COVID hit and it just took time. And I had to regather and, you know, connect with new people. I can't, get, I can't even leave America right now. So eventually got it all down. I'm very, very, very happy that I got it all down. And actually took that extra time because, like you said, it's really quite exciting stepping into the teacher role um, with all the experience that I can draw from. And the more that I teach, it's like I just keep it. I just keep getting better every day. It's like what I, some of the elbows that I teach in the system, um, I, I actually <clears throat> I'm actually better at elbow fighting now than I was when I was fighting. Um, <clears throat> in theory, in the sense that, of course, I'm not training and smashing. You know, fifty thousand hours. Over the over the course of building up for a fight, because I don't do that anymore, um, so it's hard to say. Oh, I could go on a fight and do all this stuff, but the idea around it, and the the technique around it, and the philosophy around it, and the movement of it is just I've gone like eh, ten times better than I was when I was fighting. So whoever gets the opportunity to learn from me now is actually better off now than they were when I was a professional fighter, because now I've really just taken off and opened up the whole pathway into the relaxation. Mm. even of teaching <clears throat> but not not in the sense where it's monkey magic not in the sense where it's like oh look at all these combinations and i'm doing all this movement so no 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 no, not like that because you know the, the one thing that you can you can be sure about with me with anyone who wants to learn from me is that everything is that i teach is possible because yeah. i've been a real fighter and real fights against real opponents and i know what works and i know what doesn't work Yep. And if I'm teaching you a, if I'm teaching you a, say an eight punch combination or an eight hit combination, it's got nothing to do with the fight. It's got everything to do with just connecting to your body and understanding your body can do those things. Yep. It'll be broken and dissections. But in the elbow series, if you, as you said, you've been watching it, it's really choppy and it's really you know two threes, fours max, one twos, threes, fours. That's about it. You know, you don't really get a five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Doesn't yep. go like that because our elbows don't work like that. Yeah. Sometimes it's just bang, one elbow and it's all over. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah. yeah, it's interesting you say about um, getting better and understanding of or your teaching and learning. Uh, they, they echo the same thing in, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, like that people are uh, really, their game increases monumentally when they start to teach certain techniques because they're breaking it down in their mind and they're understanding a little more than than they may have before. So I guess it's the same type of thing, right? You're really breaking things down and it becomes even more clear to you, you know, and also thinking about how to deliver that to the other people that you're teaching. 
exactly, mate. Yeah. Um, so a couple of times you've you've just um you've talked about having traveled here and traveled there. I guess that's one of your um the benefits of having been uh, a fighter that you've you've had the opportunity to travel all over the place. Like right now, you're in the US, having a look online, you fought in Turkey, uh, Gold Coast, of course, many times, Perth, USA, Netherlands, uh, down in Melbourne, Jamaica. Sydney, Sweden, Japan, Hong Kong, and even Macau, where I'm at. So, how has that journey been, man? Is that to you? Is that a benefit of the of the actual job and the work of traveling around and, and getting to see the world? I mean, absolutely. When I was, you know, when I was in the heat of it and being, you know, as a fighter, champion, and, and traveling and doing things like that and fighting, you know, it's it's obviously a great opportunity to to, to see the world, but. You know, when you when when you when you're starting a journey like that, like you could see, oh yeah, it'd be cool to be able to do this, it'd be cool to be able to do that. But really, I was I was really just always focused on the one thing, which was you know becoming, a, well, actually <clears throat> becoming great, becoming a champion, and staying a champion. So it didn't, to to me, it didn't really matter where I was, where I was fighting, where I was going. Of course, it's a side benefit and a side perk. Where the actual the 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 looking back, if I was to write a, a book or one day get someone to ghost write for me, there's so many amazing journeys so many amazing um, stories within those cultural, you know, times of flying here and fighting there and traveling here and traveling that and just expanding, expanding, expanding your mind. But for me, the actual biggest travel was actually when I retired and started doing seminars and I was just like <clears throat> went crazy through Europe to like countries like Serbia, where now I have a gym called Ronan Carnage Global in Serbia, in Switzerland, and also one in Montenegro. So I, 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 I got really close to a guy called Misha and uh, in, in Novi Sad, Serbia. So he was a big fan of my style and he was kind of in a, in a, in a, in a, in a time where he was kind of like cultivating a style for even though he was a good fighter, but he never really did great, great, great high level things. And he trained a lot of Dutch guys and then he was more Misha on carbon. So he started to take some techniques from him and he said there was always something missing. And then when I, when I had turned up on his doorstep, um, not just like that, but, you know, it was planned, but, it was like, that's what it is. It's the carnage. That's what I was yeah. a big, a big, big fan of me and, and, and stuff like that. So then, then I got to travel like through Bosnia and Croatia and Slovenia and Slovakia and like you know, Austria and Prague and like all these different countries, obviously Ireland, Italy and the UK and different things like that. And Brazil and Canada and Australia and even back to my home country. I was born in New Zealand and throughout Australia. And the list goes on. So I got to really do a lot of things. It was almost like when I retired, I got to do this farewell, like not a farewell tour, but almost like a thank, go thank all your fans tour. Mm. Because here I was in Serbia and I had 80 people in a hall, 80 people in Serbia. I'm thinking, how do you people even know I am? And it made you think, okay, when I was fighting before it was even YouTube or Instagram or social media, which was when I was a champion, which was the best time to be a champion because you're a real champion. Uh, Because you just did shit without talking about it. And these people knew who I was and they all turned up. So I was was, was almost like going around the world to countries and meeting people that were inspired by me while I was just in my gym doing my thing, not knowing that they were even existing in my life. And it was kind of like the surreal feeling, which is kind of cool. So I did all that for many, 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 many years. And then I decided a few years ago that, you know, I need to look for a new opportunity. The Gold Coast is small. I could stay there. But what's next for the carnage? What's next for Nathan Corbett? What I always wanted to achieve bigger things. So then I thought, okay, let's try America. Because America is, you know, a big, big, big country with a lot of opportunities. So then three years ago, I moved here. And I've just been building. Of course, we've had a pandemic, so things slowed down. But this year, things have taken off again and just, you know, building new roads, new connections, new pathways, online fight commentating now on TV, uh, which is super cool, and UFC Fight Pass. So just, it's, it's a lot of things, you know, to be a champ, to become a champion, to be a champion, to be, I guess, a Hall of Fame, become, I guess, in some people's minds, you know, a legend. You know, there is a lot of, you know, benefits and, and, and perks that come with that. But, of course, it doesn't come without the sacrifice and the discipline and the hard work and everything and sometimes the pain as well um, yep. to be able to get to that place. Yeah. Yeah, man. Would it, would it be right in saying then that when you were, like, you were traveling around fighting, you didn't really have that chance to, you know, really look around and, and, and kind of see where you are because you're too tunnel visioned on just getting to the place and fighting and then probably getting home. Whereas now you've got a little bit more, bit more time. You can, you're not just focused on your self training, et cetera. You can actually, you know, 
open your eyes a bit wider. Yeah, that's right. I mean, obviously, you know, when I did those fights, I still was, you know, trying to capture the moment as best I could. And there was a lot of good memories. But, you know, you are in that, that stress state that, you know, you're going, you're here to fight, you're here for business. It's not just a holiday. And keep, you know, keep, keep, got to keep focused, you know, because, you know, when I would travel to Bali for holidays, you know, that would be my, when I went to a hotel, to me, that was like relaxation, you know, food, whatever I wanted to eat, kind of like feeling. So then when I travel outside of my house, outside of my home, I go to these hotels, I had to keep, I had to remember, no, you're not on holiday. Like this, yep. this is a fight, you know, it's a fight business. So of course I, you know, I never slipped or anything like that, but yeah, it is different, definitely different. Um, you know, doing it more without having to obviously perform uh, as such in the ring. Yeah, man. Um, I was listening to some of your um, interviews, et cetera, just preparing to have a talk with you and, and uh, listening to something a few years ago uh, with Paddy Holland, uh, Irish fellow, looks a bit like Conor McGregor, <laughs> a skinnier one. Paddy, yeah, Paddy, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I got the feeling listening to it that um, there were some, you know, that there were some difficulties transitioning from being the man, being the fighter, you know, fighting, competing, to then uh, taking on that next journey in your life. You mentioned about like um, about wanting to get in there and you know mess up some <laughs> some young guys, etc. And and the next part of the journey was like kind of a different journey to you, and that you and you were touching on BJJ, touching on doing something different like dancing or something. Uh, Tell us how it was like. I mean, that switch from finishing fighting to where you are now. I guess. Yeah, yeah, good. That's a good pickup. It's 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 showing how intelligent you are in your research. So good job there. Yeah, I was a few years back. I was traveling through Ireland and doing yep. some seminars. One of my friends, actually, who I'd done a warrior retreat with, Niall. Um, he, you know, he's Irish, so he, he had some connections through that. And Patty was like, "Yeah, come in the gym," and then you know, he threw me on his podcast. And you know, he's a great man, really great man. So it was a, the honest truth is, is, you know, retiring from the ring wasn't my choice. It wasn't like I just woke up and said, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. Let's go, you know, let's go, uh, let's go do this. You know, it was like, it was like accumulation of like <clears throat> days, weeks and months that I just was like, I just don't, my body's just not working anymore. Like I just, my nervous system is like, just can't handle the stress. It can't handle that high intensity of the output and, and aggression and, and, and just, just absolute carnage, I guess. Um, so it wasn't like it was a decision based off of how I've achieved everything I want to achieve. I'm happy with my life. I want to move on now. It was like, it was almost like it was forced. It wasn't like my, my mind wanted to fight. My body said, we're not doing this. Um, and body meaning nervous system, not just the actual physical limbs. Yeah. So, so it was super tough. So then I felt for many years, you know, obviously, uh, you know, not regret, but like bitter. I felt bitter around the idea that why can't I fight when there's people like, you know, you know, older than me that are still fighting that I had to fight, stop at, at 35, I had to retire. Why can't I keep doing it? So there's a lot of bitterness. And, was, and then around that, it's more than even that. It's like, okay, well, who am I? What am I? What am I supposed yeah, yeah. to do? As a man, it's like one, for how much, how am, I, how, how am I supposed to replace whatever money I was earning per year fighting, which wasn't huge in Muay Thai, but it was still pretty good um, considering Muay Thai pay is not, not that high mine was pretty good how am i going to replace that because as soon as you stop fighting that goes to zero it's not like you get half and you get you know you get like a, a payment plan for the next five years until you figure out your life boom as soon as you say i'm not fighting anymore boom zero sponsors boom zero now you're at zero so yeah. <laughs> now you got to figure out a what makes you happy b what's going to fulfill your life c the, the grieving and loss of your career and then d how am i supposed to make a living yeah. Right. So all these things just <clears throat> hit you so yeah. hard. So the best way that I describe it to people is like, <clears throat> it's like you die, but you're still alive. Yeah. So now you now you're dead, but you have to live. Because most people, when they die, they don't know about it because they're dead. So it's like <laughs> it's you heavy, die, man. That's heavy. It's like you're dead and you're just walking amongst the living, but you're still mm. alive as well. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. so then I just so then proact. So then I talk about like my next mission, which I found my next mission, you know, recently. And I talk about, okay, it wasn't just like I just drifted for seven years lost in the sea. I definitely was lost in the thought of what is it and what should I, and what could I, and how can I make it now? I'm 41. I need to make money. It's important because you're getting older. It's more important to make money when you're older, when you're younger and all these kind of things. 
ideas around it at least, but it is still important as a, as a growing man to, to have financial, you know, backing mm. or not backing, but like security and whatever yep, yep. for many reasons. Um, and so I was like drifting, but pro- proactively drifting. It's not like I was just drifting and just like doing nothing. I was, I did like 140 seminars in the last seven years all around the world. I did, you know, many different kind of things. I, I moved to America. I trained Bellator fighters. I trained, you know, UFC fighters a couple of times. I, I got a commentating gig and become like, you know, the color commentator for line flight. i done 16 shows, but never even learned. How, I didn't even know how to do commentary. I just said, yeah, I'll do it. And I just yep. jumped in there with no, we just did it. You know, I moved countries, you know, it's another whole battle. Then you'd never, I mean, you'd understand living offshore, but man, it's, it's a different trip. Moving yeah, man. countries completely yeah. it's like unless you've done it you'll never get it <laughs> and i like yeah even 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 since it's an english-speaking country so i thought it would be just easy easy, easy but there's a lot of moving parts to it. it's not just like that yeah so pro- proactively swimming towards finding land again and i just yeah. sort of you know recently in this you know last sort of quarter uh it was last year it was, just, it was tough for everyone it was like oh, okay now i know what the mission is now i found my mission because for men it's all about a mission you know the mission yeah, yeah. as a teenage the mission as a teenager was to become strong defend myself don't let anyone ever you know pick on you or you know hit you or do anything become strong and that's what a man needs to be then the second mission was like okay now you're a champion now you need now this is the only thing you're going to do now you need to make money you need to be the best in the world you need to like be the best there ever was and so then you can become something and then that mission passed and it's like now the next mission is what is it and then the next, now i'm like oh okay now the mission is is to really help people yeah my, my mission now is to inspire people to you know, to educate people through either technique or through concepts of the mind through things that i've you know done to become a champion to stay a champion so then i really kicked it's that okay okay how can i serve people um, of course, we need to make money. That's why there's a price tag on my actual videos because I can't right now at this stage financially do it for free. However, I would if I had, you know, you know, Mr. You know, Amazon's bank account, but I don't. So it's like the next mission. So it's all about finding the mission. So those last seven years was, uh, I mean, you know, I still have days and still have moments, but I'm kind of surpassing the idea of feeling like I need to ever fight again because that sort of yeah. lingered and lingered and lingered and lingered and lingered. I'm like, but now it's kind of like, okay, moving on, how can I, and, and, and I used to be afraid of making someone better than me, yeah. you know, because I was some kind of, no one's better than me, I'm, 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 I'm winning, you know, I yeah. used to be afraid of like making someone better than me, but now I'm like, I don't even care because eventually they'll be at a place where they won't be better than someone. And eventually they'll be at a place where they won't be better than someone. Cause that's, that's just the, the evolution of aging. It's just the evolution of life. It's just how things are. Yeah. Yeah. But yet now I'm in a place where you can't get to this place. Just like you can't get a hall of fame medal without being retired. So it's like there's times and places where you get to at certain levels and you yeah. can't get there unless it's through this, this this journey of time and age yeah and that's a that's a great insight into how it feels for for a professional fighter to retire a professional fighter at a, at a high level man because yeah i didn't yeah. think of it as that intense but yeah you can see that and you can understand why why fighters um you know get depressed after they finish their career or why fighters just keep fighting until they shouldn't be fighting anymore so that's a that's a great insight into so that, that man. yeah yeah, I mean, there's a lot of fighters that shouldn't be fighting that you know are right now, but they can't give up, you know, yeah. because they can't they can't let go of that idea to be without it, you know. And yeah. and, and when they when they finally get there, they are gonna struggle big time. Yeah, and you mean I there's didn't no, think of those other facets that you said about yeah, you it's a, it's also about all your fucking income just destroyed, like it's gone if you didn't save or anything, you're fucked, right? So yeah, it's a it's a, yeah, and we're, and we're not winning UFC belts, getting paid a million bucks a fight, or you know, boxing yeah, fights, and yeah, yeah exactly stuff like a, that. So, you know, the the pay the pay is uh, is is minimal. So, all the money that I earned my flight career is gone. So, like yeah, you know, it's not it's not like I retired. I'm like, oh, okay, I can just cruise now. Yeah, um, like a Floyd Mayweather or you know some kind of like you know Conor McGregor's or whatever. But <clears throat> it's all good. It's all good. You know, we're all. Honestly, like we all, you know, have different journeys, different paths, different, um, you know, destinies and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So yep. it's just a matter of, I, I say to my students now, there, there's, there's no other option but winning. 
right? Yeah. I said, there's no, there's no other option but winning. Now, what does that look like? It's like, well, it's not, I'm not saying you have to win your next fight. What I'm saying is there's no other option but winning. So what does winning look like? Winning looks like you just don't give up. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Winning, just, yeah. winning is just not giving up because that's the, other, that's the only option. Because when you think about it, really, is there any other option? Yeah. There isn't. <laughs> that's it. That's it. There isn't. So Man, simplifying just, the, the command so- sometimes. Jumping back to something you said before about um, the nervous system breaking down, I'm just interested in understanding what does that mean, like your nervous system breaking mm. down? Does that mean your reflex is not working? You're, you're uh, getting tired easier? What does it mean? Oh, like my reflexes, like right now, like faster than I've ever been in my life. It's insane. Mm. Like I'm so quick. It's so, it's, it's crazy. Like at least in my hand speed, it's oh, so fast. Yeah. So what it really is, is that, you know, the, the nervous system, and I, I don't use these words, the nervous system, because I, I, I met a guy um, who helped me doing some healing. It's called neurophysics, and it's all around the nervous system and neuro, yeah. neurological pathways of the mind to the body and stuff like that. So I only use those words, nervous system, and to understand those words. I didn't understand what was going on all the time. So it's really just like the adrenal glands and, and, and all that aggressive, fight or flight energy that it takes to be a champion mm. that, that that burns that burns the engine yeah you know it's like there's no way in the world that you know you can just keep racing that engine and burn that engine forever without there's some kind of like you know something happening and something going wrong so some people yeah. necessarily don't necessarily get there but um it happened to me in the sense that i it wasn't like Oh, it happened to me. It was more like, oh, that's what it is. Because mm-hmm. I only learned many years later, oh, that's what it is. My nervous system is cool. Because it's like, you know, if I have like too much coffee now, I'm just like, oh, yeah, if it, hit, it, it just hits me too much. It's like, it's almost like I'm, the fight or flight. The best way to explain it is the fight or flight senses that we have, mm-hmm. right? when you are fighting at that highest level and just grinding every day on the pads and smashing every day, you're like, taxing that flight or flight system to the highest end well eventually that gets to a point and not in everyone but obviously in certain people it just like had enough and i just couldn't if i if i train hard i need to like sleep for a day or two you know yeah yeah it's not so much that my my speed or my reflexes or my my motor skills are still super fast my brain my articulation everything is fine it's just more i just the tank's empty yeah. I've only got this, they've only got this much fuel to burn. And then if I'm burning all of it, then I'm tired. Yep. So to, so to train and do my normal life, it's okay. But to like put in like, you know, two hours in the morning and two hours at night, you know, five, six days a week for the next 12 weeks is like not possible. Man, do you think part of that would have been, uh, I mean, part of the life of you, as a, as a fighter being X amount of years, do you think it would have been like you mentioned from just the, that real, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the yin yang, like the yang's hard style. Like you're just bang, 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 smashing bags, smashing pads, smashing opponents, um, like nonstop. Whereas if you compare, like some of the styles of different people, where they're more relaxed and just loose and not yeah, not yeah. powering, they might have a little bit of a longer life because you're not punishing themselves as much. That's it. You, you said it perfectly. It's 15 years of carnage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, you know, 15 years. That's why I had 60 wins out of 40, 64 fights with 42 knockouts, um, you know, because I was ripping bags of piles, ripping everything apart in front of me. Yeah. So, and, like, uh, you know, maybe, 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 like, the right nutrition with the right nutritionalist or the right vitamins and the right this and the right that and that are all the stuff they have today at the highest level. Maybe with all that going on, maybe it would have been a different scenario but the honest truth is i never had a dietitian i never yep. had a nutritionist i never had a uh, a person you know guiding me on the right things to do and the right things to take yeah even just, that just just went for it you know even those advances in yeah resting and recovery and all that sort of stuff may have been a, a balance for you right um i remember yeah. a while back maybe a couple of months ago, I spoke with Cameron Quinn and it's just touching on karate mm. with the, 
the um, you know, balancing things. Um, I can't remember exactly what he was I was referring to, but talking about balance in a martial art, how some of these external sort of MMA styles, et cetera, are kind of missing some of that traditional sort of side. And yeah, I wonder if if that's if there was a softer side that someone introduced into your training, be it rest and recovery, be it something else. I wonder if that would have benefited at all just to balance it, you know? You know what, mate, it, it possibly, and I've thought about it many times and, and, uh, and then I look back and I'm like, well, I just did what I, what I had to do to win. And that's what yeah. happened, you know? And, so, what was it? I mean, and the reality is, is what more could have I achieved, you know, yeah, exactly. had, had, had another yeah. 10 fights and another 10 wins and had another two world titles. Who, who gives a shit once you won 11, who needs 12, who needs 13, who needs exactly. 13, you know what I mean? Yeah. Who cares? You know, it's, it, it actually it actually sounds stupid if you said I have 15 world titles, you know? <laughs> true. Sounds like, kind of hey. <laughs> that sounds weird, you know what I mean? Like yeah. Um, so so there's not really more I could do. So really for me, you know, I'm not religious, but maybe it was just God's way of saying, This is yeah. it, this is the end, you've done that. Eventually you're gonna find the out, found out the reason why you've done that, you're gonna move on, you're gonna be able to help people and change people's life. Yeah, but we're not without we're not without falling first and going through hell and coming out the other end. So yeah, it is a journey, and uh, I feel like I'm really much closer to where I need to be going. Yeah, evidently for the rest of my life now than I have been before. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And like I said, I was only I was only watching the end of that Holohan one this morning, and I can see that you're in a different place even than three years ago. So. That obviously you're progressing through things, you know, pretty well, and you're you're onto that journey, and you are moving forward. You know, it's not stopping at the end and just doing and then stopping there. It's moving forward, so that's cool, man. Um, one thing you mentioned then was about smashing pads, smashing this, smashing that. I noticed in the, in your in your drills and that man, you're still kind of smashing uh smashing people in um in your drills. It's kind of that Dutch style um drilling, right? Like you you're pretty full on, man. Like you're still maintaining that movement, and your drills are are, are realistic. You know, it's not slowed down enough that it's not uh, applicable to real fighting. So that's what I think. That's why your um your reflex and that and your speed is like you said the best it's been because of the, the way you, tr you train still. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's actually true. It's, it's so true. And then the crazy thing is, is when I was fighting, we didn't do Dutch drills because you know, that's a Dutch thing. Muay Thai yeah. fighters don't do Dutch drills. Yeah. But when I started teaching seminars, I had to learn how to teach. I was like, okay, this, this is how you got to partner up. Right. Yeah. So then it, so it, was, so it was an evolution and a progression of like partnering up. And obviously I went to, you know, Europe spent many times, like I said, over there with Misha yeah. and Serbia and, they do all the Dutch stuff because that's their they're closer to the K1 rule fighting and stuff like that. So that's sort of more or less how I would give people yeah. an idea to, to train it. Cause you know, yeah. cause you could do the same thing with someone holding pads, but you know, when I've got a class of 10 or 20, 20 people and they don't even know how pads and like, okay, we're just going to do it like this. You know, when yeah. I'm teaching a seminar, there's 30 people. Okay. We don't have 30 sets of pads or whatever, 15 sets of pads. So we're going to do it like this. That's sort of more or less yeah. where that start, even though the Dutch do it like that anyway. It's not really a Thai style or Thai thing, but I've yeah. always had a high, I've always had a high bred style anyway, where I'm not, I'm definitely a Thai boxer, but I'm not like full traditional. Um, yeah. I'm not a, I'm not a, not a Dutch kickboxer, but I love boxing, I love hands and I love footwork. Yeah. So I'm kind of a high breed in the sense that my movements are slightly different, but it, it yeah. still looks like Muay, Muay Thai and sure. uh, the technique is, is Muay Thai in some way. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, exactly. So I, um, I, uh, the good thing about what I do with my students and what they, you know, people need to understand about me and, and other, and other, other teachers is, is that you're playing with a light. Okay. So, um, and I'm, and, and I'm not saying that in an ego way. I mean, it like, you know, you gotta know who you are. And I realized just recently who I am, like you're playing with a light, like you're playing with a guy who's had, you know, 64 pro fights, you know, and had a big career for a lot of big names, didn't finish, didn't finish all of the fights that he wanted to finish. So he still has a lot of fire inside of him. He still has a lot of passion inside of him. He still has a lot of intensity inside of him. He still has a lot of, you know, like I can see anger. it, man. I, I'm not angry because I don't have anger inside me. It's not anger. I just still have I just have a lot of passion, a lot of fire, yeah. a lot of a lot of venom. Yeah. Um. Still inside me. So, you want to if you if you get the opportunity to be around that, I mean, that's the best thing you could ever ask for. In any in, in, as a martial arts student, whether you're mother or father or, or or 
you know, just a you know a straight up student, or you're yeah. you want, or you you aspiring to be a champion. Like yeah. that's the best thing you could ever ask to be around. Because I don't, I don't hit anyone in the brain. I just yeah. hit them around the around the guard or chop the leg a little bit, like a little yeah. spark a little bit. But it's not like I'm trying to like kick through them and really hurt them yeah, or yeah, break yeah. their ribs or anything. So it's not easy. It's like seventy percent, but the thirty percent that goes to a hundred, you don't want to be there. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? No, if, if I teach you, if, if I teach you at ten percent, that's cool. If I'm just teaching technique as far as the the actual movement of the pat of the perfect perfection of the technique, yeah. I can teach that ten percent. But most of the times, when I teach a seminar, I tell people that when they finish the seminar, they're probably going to forget everything that I taught them. But the one thing they're going to remember is the power of the energy. The, yeah. the spirit, the spirit of kindness, the spirit of what made me such a champion fighter. It wasn't, and I always say this, it wasn't that I was technically better than anyone or physically stronger than anyone or fitter than someone. It's just that the will to win was so much greater than my opponent. Yeah. And of course, I trained hard and developed skill sets and, and I have intelligence in fighting. I, 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 grew, I grew to become intelligent in fighting. It yeah. was the will to win and the will, and that's why my elbows were so savage because I certainly wasn't out there to play games. I was certainly out yep. there to destroy and finish and make sure that I was the one standing to get to the next stage that I need to get in my life. So, yeah, yeah this is, it's just great. And the students that you know, hang around and get to know about that, they love it and they respect me for it. And I'm just building power fuel. So that's why, yep. I like, as a, as a collective, yep. I want to start doing a lot more, like, speaking stuff, even, like, eventually have a speaking video that people can buy. Yeah, yeah. It's just me talking about these things because these things are really this sort of without it saying it's a secret because nothing's mm. a secret but it's like kind of like the gems and the gold and the breath it's kind of like the breath yeah that puts it, it that puts you know oxygen into your lungs and some there's, there's a lot of this mind stuff a lot of this yeah, thing yeah. that activates it's like an activation of the technique because the technique is a technique but without the activation of the spirit in the technique it's just like another technique and that's yeah, the difference between car carnage elbows and most other people's elbows. Of course, yeah. there's some other great great guys out there that do savage elbows, like Liam and like all these, you know, yeah. Haggy Haggerty and all these cool ties and stuff like that as well. There's some badass out there doing great elbows. I'm not the only yeah. one, but overall, there's not many. So it's this, it's it's the spirit that's in it. Yeah, no, it's, it makes perfect sense, and especially with you describing it. And I, I like that intensity, man, although I don't know if I'm a student in there and, and Carnage says, okay, Toby, come here, I'm going to demonstrate. I think, oh, fuck. In my head, I'm going, fuck, here we go. <laughs> they, all, but, um, no, they all say that. I get, I get a bit of grief sometimes on social yeah. media. Yeah. Um, Because well, the last four months is when I started posting up videos because yeah. the first time I've actually had a gym where I'm working at, or well, actually my, my friend and I are running it together, the Rising yeah. Sun's. Thai boxing in Newport Beach here, California. And uh, now I have students. Yeah, yeah. So now we have students. I go back to my karate roots. I make them bow in. You know, they, yeah, they yeah. call me sensei. They call me sensei because I don't connect to crew because I'm not from the, the Thai yeah. way. I'm more like karate sensei. Yep. Um, Cameron Quinn sort of, you know, era. And I, I like that yep. respect because I teach them about respect and, you know, and lining up and bowing and all the kind of stuff like that. But, yep. Yeah, so now I have a, now I have students to be able to teach and lead, and um, and the, uh, obviously I've had a platform to, to demonstrate, film it, and then throw it on Instagram. You know, obviously it's you know uh, giving away content, building building you know your business, and you know that's all for free. Obviously, this product you've got to buy, but that stuff that I give away is just inspiring people, giving people ideas, different techniques. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you, know, you get a cute couple of haters out there, you know what I mean? That you know try to tell me that my techniques are shit and that oh, doesn't work and. Oh, all this kind of negativity yeah i've had a few dms saying you know i want to i want to fight you let me know when you're in town all this <laughs> Jesus. Kind of shit. and i'm like well so I kind, of, I kind of got a little bit like hurt i got hurt i got hurt by the first i was like i'm yeah. just trying to help people like just well let's leave me alone like fuck off you know i'm just trying to help people i'm not trying to ask you to buy anything in, in this particular situation and yeah. so now i just now i don't even now I just go block the lead like i literally yeah. just block it so i'm cutting out the cancer yeah, day man. by day by day, I'm cutting out cancer out of my life, and I only want positivity in my life. So if you're not positive, see you later. Exactly, and man. And, 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 and that's including myself. Yeah, yeah. If I if I'm not if I'm not if I keep if it was, I can be negative. If I'm not positive, like, mate, if 
come on, see you later. We're not doing this shit. Yeah. So I, I command that respect for my students. I give my, and I have to command and respect for myself by doing it to myself. And just yeah. with all this negativity on Instagram, I just, I don't even, I, don't, I used to write back going, yeah, you want to go? Let's fucking do this then. Yeah. And, and now I'm like, block, delete, like cut it. Like they can't even message me ever again because they're gone. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> don't off. feed that negativity. Like you said, be it, be it some troll that's got nothing in his life yeah. and, and lives off upsetting people or, or you like you said in yourself. Don't accept yeah. that negativity. It makes sense. Just jumping back to that that intensity, man. I, I I like it. I think it's the best way for people to train. And you're doing that Dutch style, particularly. You know, you could sit back and be like relax and just tappy tappy. From that to a fight, it doesn't translate. But if you're at seventy percent or 70 percent training those those shots, it's it's not far away to escalate it to that fighting style. Whereas if you're ten percent and you got to get to ninety percent, it's too too distant, right? So it's much more realistic. Yeah. Well, the other thing is that is this right? If you throw a, if you throw a technique ten percent, it takes less energy. If you, mm. throw, if you, if you throw a ten a technique at ten percent, it's not hard to keep in balance. Yeah. Right. So if you throw a, ten, a, a technique at a hundred percent, you got to try and be in balance at a hundred percent. Yeah. Yep. You got to you know I mean also the effort it takes to throw a hundred percent. So yep. it's not only draining the engine. From energy, it's also you have to learn how to be in balance at a hundred percent of your power. Mm. Now, I'm not asking you to hit someone in the head hundred percent of your power in, in a drill, but when you're going at a higher pace towards that, you're going to have a shorter, shorter time frame of connecting it to, like you just said, a hundred percent later. So there's time when we go slow, there's time when we go fast, there's time when we go hard, there's times where you spar hard, there's times when you spar a lot. Like there's times where I'm like, okay, we're sparring. It's like, fucking go. Mm. Like, no spinning heel kicks to the head, no push kicks to the face because there's no protection on your heel and your toe. Okay. Clearly no groin shots, you know, which no one does anyway. And no <laughs> elbows. Yeah. So, really what it, so really what it is, is it's just kickboxing sparring because, I mean, you can throw some light knees, but you don't want to throw too hard. So this, but, but you got pads on, you got big gloves on, like, let's go. Yeah. You know yep. I mean? Especially Man. as a Westerner. And the reason why I said as a Westerner, because you don't, you're not Ty who's grown up in a camp from the age of five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years of age and having to fight at three fights a weekend from the age of 10 to 18. And you've already had 150 fights by the time you're 18 and you have another 150 fights when you're 18 and 30 and retire. You're a Westerner, you've had like one fight and you're only 21 years old and, you, and by the time you're 30, you have like 30 fights. That's it, yeah. right? Yeah. So like you, the only way you're going to be able to catch up on any of that time is actually having some kind of real life situation training, sparring part yeah, yeah. To, to, to make it feel like it's real. Just like a professional boxer, mm. he's only fighting professionally three times, two times a year. What he's going to do with those other, you know, 300 days of the year that he's in a training camp, he has to, he has to. So there's, look, there's, there's, there's ways to do it that's intelligent and there's ways to do it that's stupid. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm definitely uh, more, more aggressive than most people. And, I, and, I, and, and I've been known for being a hard sparring partner. But at the same time, I also am kind and gentle to the people that, are at a place where they're not there yet. Yeah. Now uh, you touched yeah. on that um that Thai uh the Thai style. Yeah, it's it's something that I always feel too. Like because people always like, ah, oh, I want to get better at, at Thai boxing. I go to Thailand. I do this, and it's just a whole different mentality, right? It's like the long journey, the long slow journey, the long slow training. Whereas the Western style seems to be let's let's fit it in, boom boom boom. Let's let's intensity pack it in because we don't have the same sort of lifestyle. Even we don't like you said, don't start from that young age. It's a whole different journey. So it's a it's a lot more compressed and compressed time and you know, really um, putting more energy in into small uh, sections, if you know what I mean. Like very, very different feeling, right? The the whole training systems and everything than from the West to to Thailand, right? Yeah, I mean, it's completely different. And the other thing you have to consider is your weight class. You know, mm. like weight class changes yeah, yeah, styles. Yeah. You know, what yeah, I mean? true. like of course, if you if you're like if you're forty kilos, fifty kilos, <laughs> even sixty kilos. Yeah. It's a different fight. It's a yeah, different yeah, fight. True, true. If you look at that over all styles, mm. you look at that over boxing, you look at that over um, MMA now, and you look at it in Thai boxing. 
It's yeah. a different style of a fight. It's a different pace of a fight. It's a different. It's a different game. And you get a little bit heavier to like you know from cruiser weight, you know, even super middleweight, you know, which is seventy six kilos. Then you get up to like you know your eighty two, eighty six kilos, and you're ninety two, and then you're ninety five, and then you're obviously you're hundred plus. Yeah. It's a different style. It's a different game. So all I can do is you know talking to me, even talking about myself as far as my style, like. You know, it's it's different. Like my style is different because you know I was I was predominantly fighting at eighty six kilograms for five years of my peak of my career, and then the last you know four years was at ninety five kilograms. Yeah. So like so that so like nine years of the peak of my career, even though I was lighter before that, um, you know, is it it big big guys, big guys. But I'm fast, I'm agile, I'm quick, I'm as fast as middleweight, I'm hitting like a heavyweight. So. Not a super heavy one. I certainly don't have one shot kind of power, even though I did stop people with one shot, but more of their, their constant, you know, aggression. But an elbow obviously finishes anyone. Yeah. So, yeah. So, it's, yes, that's the other thing that you have to, you know, put into, take into to, to consideration, obviously, is the, the styles are also changed by weight division. Yeah, yeah. I didn't think of that, actually. Um, two more things before, before I let you go, mate. I wanted to talk about... Um, you mentioned about MMA uh, that you've you've helped a couple of people prepare and learn learn a bit more in your style. I've always thought, and and watching some of your fights now, that like I watch a lot of MMA and I'm I'm very interested in it. And um, the your style is a lot more compatible to MMA than a lot of uh, a lot of other Thai stylists, you know, that are really high up and relaxed or different. You're you're moving forward aggressive. Uh, balance sort of style, I think, is a lot more applicable to MMA. What do you think about that? Do you do you do you find that you can teach it quite well? That actually fits in with the the wrestling and and ground fighting, etc. Like your stance and the way you teach, because I feel it, it would apply pretty well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, look, my first, you know, you had, I had like a, you know, uh, I guess like a, a wish list or like a, a list of things. Okay, I moved to America. I'll be like, okay, what's some things I can do? Mm. Seminars, okay. Um, train some MMA fighters, you know, obviously, whatever, UFC, um, UFC fighters. Um, maybe open up a gym, um, commentating, um, maybe become an actor, you know, like kind of like a list like yeah. this, right? So I got here and I sort of eventually um, circled around and, and ended up getting to know the owner of, you know, uh, Ruka, um, yep. Pat Tenori, and you know, got to be circled around that. You know, he was obviously BJ Penn, number one man sponsor, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So then I got to be around that his uh, his kind of pool of people. So then I started to train um, some MMA fighters, and uh, I trained Chris Cyborg for a few weeks, but then oh, she, she 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 sort of went walk about, and that was fine, whatever. Yeah. And then I trained a few guys, just a few like local Hawaiian guys for Bellator Hawaii, which was super cool guys who fought on Bellator. And I trained Aaron Pico, who's yeah, uh, yeah, with Bellator Aaron Pico, yeah. for, for a few months before he moved out to Albuquerque. And I trained uh, Cheeto there a few times, you know, maybe like five or six times, just, you know, between his other training that he does. Um, so, you know, I had a little bit of a play and I've just started training these two wrestlers that one of them signed with Bellator. They had one fight and I'm training them now as well. And another fighter, Sean, which is going for his first pro fight. So just was dibbling and dabbling with it. And I went, you know what? I'm not even going to worry about training these people anymore because they've got 5,000 trainers and yep. too many different bosses. And, then, you know, obviously, like I told you earlier, you get all you need to make money. And if you can't pay your money. And so I sort of swapped away from the idea of trying to becoming a trainer for UFC fighters or this kind of business. Yep. Um, but then recently, of course, you know, I've been getting super, super busy with my personal training. Um, Marvin, the guy who, I can't remember his last name now, it's how bad, but Marvin who fought uh, Stolbender. Vittori. Um, Vittori, Marvin Vittori. Uh, he just recently reached out to me on Instagram asking me if I could, you know, catch up with him and do some training when he got when yeah. back from Italy. So yeah. we would probably, he'll probably circle back around to me again and we, that'd be pretty cool. Because just recently as I started to train all these people and becoming pretty full on with even just clients and teaching my classes and um i'm like okay well yeah i definitely know i could be doing something for them but to really answer your question is that there's something that i can teach every mma fighter and let's just talk about america right now because that's where i am that mm. no one else can no one else can do yeah and that's my style of Thai boxing isn't like traditional Thai boxing where I'm going to play 
the game or I'm going to score. And you, yeah. you, with MMA, you can't be playing that game because they'll shoot and take you down. So you can't be just like scoring points and worrying about that. It's like it's a battleground. So one is the warrior energy of tones, which is the kill kill spirit. Two yeah. is understanding understanding you know the other side of martial arts. So I work with these wrestlers and sort of you know understand the game, what they can and can't do, and can't get all, can get away with. The other thing is that a lot of them don't really have good fundamental, strong, like striking knees or strong leg kicks with shins, not with feet, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and none of them, without taking any, without being rude to anyone, but none of them really understand how to use the elbows to full effect, especially when they, from the clash where they come together. Yeah. And the second one is when they hit each other and they break, they're still holding each other. Yeah. They're trying to like, you know, figure it out whether they're on the cage or whatever. The elbow strikes from there. So I have so much really that could change their lives. Yeah. Big time. So we'll just see where it goes. I'm kind of more open now again to looking into like, you know, taking on a few fighters and training them. But I, I think it would be more like, okay, pay me, you know, $5,000 and I'll, and I'll train you for this fight camp instead of like, okay, you know, pay me for one hour here, one hour there, one hour there. Like, yeah, yeah. commit, let's do it, let's get it done. I'll, 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 I'll take you over the line if it means something to you. And these, these guys, you know, they, they make money, they can do that kind of stuff. Um, and it'll certainly benefit them massively, you know. Yeah, for sure. Even just even just the way that I think, even even the mindset that I have yeah. and, and, you know, around around taking my opponent out. For it's, sure, it's with the benefit. 100% mindset. And then also, as you mentioned, I think uh, there's a lot of room for improvement in and out of the clinch against the cage, et cetera, where they'd really, I've seen people throw elbows at the right time and everything, but they don't have the right structure in their body, et cetera, when they throw, right? Like there's a, there's definitely a lot of improvement. We compare someone like you and your, your uh, base when you're throwing your balance, your, your, the structure of your body in comparison to some of these guys that are kind of just winging yeah. their arm, you know? Um, one, the yeah, last yeah, thing. No, yeah, I see, I, oh, sorry. Yeah. sorry, sorry, I see that all the time, and it's great that you. I, I really love the. I really do love how knowledgeable you are and how much research you have because you've been spot on with so many good points. So really good, good, good job, man. Thanks, so man. Just, like like you said, with winging the arm and just doing kind of weird shit, and it's just like <laughs> that's why I'm like, okay, look, I'm not saying I'm the greatest of all time. I'm not saying I'm this. I don't even give a shit. I don't even care to be the greatest of all time. If, even if I am, if people say I am, that's fine. Okay. But I think it's fine. I don't need to say it. I don't even care. But when I see something as shit, shit, I'm telling you right now, it's shit. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's, that's it. They don't know what yeah. they're doing. So I could help them. So I was thought about it the other day and thought, you know what? How about I get four of the best, give me 50 grand each, 200 grand a year, and I'll dedicate my life to them for, for the year. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And, and and that could be the difference between you know making a million dollars or losing a million dollars. Yeah, man, it's true. It's true. That's what um, it's at. That's the business. That's the business we're in now. Yep, and and let's hope a couple of them take you up on that and and, uh, and we see some <laughs> I, devastating. I, I, I just I, I, I just thought about it. I just thought about it the other day. I'm like, okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Let's hope it happens and we can see some devastating kind of elbows unleashed, man. Um. And the last thing, I, I, it's not really. I know you've you've been hit up on this before, and it, it's it only came into my head more when I'm listening to that that one last podcast I listened to is is the BJJ thing, the grappling man. You know, as a as someone that's touched on BJJ a bit, and that I really I really think it would fucking benefit you, I and mean, I'd love to see you actually try. Like, you know, there's as part of your journey. I know you're probably not doing it. You're not, you're not really interested, but I'd love to see you try it maybe more, man. Like just really feel like it would help in that, that next journey. You know what I mean? Because you can like, uh, yeah, something you can kind of do for a longer period as an older guy, I'm a little bit older than you. You can do it at a lighter pace. It also teaches you a bit of humility and, and different things like a different path. You know, what are your feelings about that? Oh man, you're right about the humility thing because that's probably the the first part that would be hard for me is the humility yeah. of getting sub submitted by you know what I would look at as yeah inferior yeah uh, exactly people <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly uh, so that would be like oh you motherfucker <laughs> um, look I thought about it and then two years ago I just had my two hips replaced yeah oh, two yeah, hip yeah. replacements two years ago um, two hip resurfacing surgery and it's still not really 
really, really really need it to be. It's still hurting. They're not quite yeah. healed. So that kind of bothers me because there's a lot of like uh, bad positions for the hips to be in and a lot of like squashing of the, you know, in, in chicken leg and just chicken yeah. arms. Yeah, just, yeah, just, you know, whatever. a lot of weird kind of like positions where the hip can get like pushed down and stomped yeah. or, or yeah. twisted or awkward positions. True. So I just think for that reason alone, I'm just like, I'm going to have to just let that one go in my next life. Yeah, yeah. Fair yeah. enough. Fair call, man. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah the, the thing that I, I, I am interested in learning, um, which I had the pleasure of learning a little bit when I was training the Bellator boys, yeah. was um, some, some wrestling defense um, yeah. and a little bit of wrestling control as well for myself, but more yeah. so the defense than, than the actual takedown, but also the upper body body lock stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, not so much like, you know, going down low for a double leg or a single yeah. leg or getting right down there, just more like body lock stuff where you're going yeah. more up, up top, like more like tie boxing style. And for and sure defending that. The, defending the takedown because jiu-jitsu is not going to work on me unless you've got me on the ground anyway. Yeah. So, um, so I might as well just learn how to defend that and then I'm <laughs> sweet. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And those, um, those positions that you're talking about, if you're talking about upper body, um, like wrestling, then that, that is good for you to have an understanding of that if you're teaching MA guys, because that's where you can, you know, work from that position to your, your stand up, uh, you know, that's throwing right. and strikes because yeah. that's, that's where they're going to be using it. Right. So it makes sense. Um, yes. Okay. Carnage. So um, we're getting towards the end. I don't want to keep you any longer, but just for anyone that has made it up to this point, um, if you want to check out any of Nathan's uh, new striking series, jump on to NathanCorbett.com. Uh, great videos. I haven't gotten all the way through yet, but what I have seen so far has been awesome. So recommend to anyone that's interested in, in learning more about elbows. Um, anything else you'd like to say, man? Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, the Nathan, the, the, the little stash there, corporate.com is the official, like, site. But obviously, if you go onto my Instagram, if you, you know, have Instagram, there's links just in the bio, bang, hit the link. Yep. And you can go there and check it out. So, of course, you know, I'd love for people to purchase it. One is, um, you know, it helps me. It, it helps me do what I do. It helps me, help gives me some finances to be able to keep giving, like I give on social media, to give to people to build um, I never lie. I never, I never try and tiptoe around things and say, you know what, we all want, we all want financial freedom. So one of the reasons why I'm doing it is to get some financial freedom so I can make some money when I'm sleeping versus getting smashed every day on the pads. However, I would never ever sell a product that's not genuine and authentic. Everything that you'll see on this program is genuine, authentic. It's passion. It's pure, pure, pure passion. That's the one thing you'll feel when you watch this video. If you feel nothing else, is you'll feel the exuding passion that's pouring out of me. So, you know, that's got nothing to do with selling a product. That's to do with just loving what I do and knowing what I do and delivering it at the best of my ability. So, awesome, man. Thank you. Great, man. So, yeah, thanks for your time. I uh, appreciate it so much. And, um, Best of luck in all your endeavors. Let's hope a couple of these uh, these big heavyweights uh, take up your advice and learn how to smash people. <laughs> Bring yeah, the carnage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that'd, be, that'd be cool. That'd be cool.